start off and to talk about uh, somatic mutations in lung tissue, uh, in normal lung tissue. Uh, the, um, we're chugging through a range of normal tissues, as I'll show you, to look at patterns of somatic mutations, really trying to understand what the processes are that uh, lead to cancer development in, uh, in normal tissues. Um, and uh, and take, uh, try and understand it. So um, we've known for many years, 400 and more years, that, uh, that smoking is bad for you. Um, this particular rant from King James I is, is now on Google Books, so you can read it for yourselves. Um, uh, and uh, this was uh, taken the other night in Lyon uh, from, um, from the restaurant that we were eating at, uh, just to show that it's, uh, that it's uh, a truly international recognition that smoking is uh, bad for you and bad for those uh, uh, neighbours uh, in your in your restaurant. Um, I, I don't propose to go through in any great detail the epidemiology of, of tobacco and lung cancer. Um, uh, there's a, there's in fact a, an amazing IARC monograph that details this in enormous uh, enormous complexity. Um, but just to point out a couple of things which are kind of curious when we think about uh, the mutational model of, of cancer development because. Um, the, the, one of the striking things is that the dose-response relationship between the number of cigarettes smoked per day or um, pack years uh, over the life and the incidence of lung cancer is that it's a linear relationship, a linear dose-response relationship, uh, as shown here. And that's not necessarily what you would expect. If, if, if tobacco acts to cause lung cancer through um, driving an increase in somatic mutations and you need, let's say, uh, N mutations, um, might be 5, might be 10, um, then anything that increases, let's say, doubles the, uh, doubles the mutation rate uh, uh, should increase the, um, uh, uh, the mutation, uh, the, the incidence of cancer in an exponential fashion, like 2 to the power of the number of driver mutations, uh, whereas, in fact, it's 2 to the power of 1, or it's, it's, it's a, to the power of 1 relationship. Um, so, so this is already kind of uh, striking. This was noted 30, 40 years ago, this paradox. Um, the other thing that's kind of curious, uh, just that, we, that I'll have some data on later, is what happens when you stop smoking. And essentially, uh, you, when you stop smoking, your risk of lung cancer um, diverges from if you carry on smoking, no matter at what stage in life you stop smoking. And what's interesting is that that benefit begins almost immediately from, from, smoking, uh, from stopping smoking. So almost instantly that you stop smoking, uh, your, rate of, uh, your rate of lung cancer begins to diverge from if you carry on smoking. Um, and uh, that, that also is, is kind of interesting uh, and not necessarily particularly well explained by our kind of uh, simplistic model of mutation, um, somatic mutations equals uh, cancer. So if one wants to sequence and identify somatic mutations in normal tissues, uh, one has to recognize that normal tissues are by and large polyclonal. So this is what a square centimeter of skin looks like in each one of these circles is a completely independent clone of cells within, uh, within that square centimeter of skin. And you can imagine that if you took that entire square centimeter, mushed it up and extracted the DNA, then what you would be sequencing are molecules of DNA from all of these different clones, and any mutation that's present in one of these clones uh, would not necessarily be present in any of the other clones, and you would, it would get lost in the, in, the, in the sequencing data. So what one has to do, there are various approaches. We've uh, mainly used two approaches. One is to use laser capture microdissection so that we're sequencing just the little clones. So we're sequencing 100, 200 cells uh, at a time rather than the entire square centimeter of skin. Um, and Tim, um, who's talking after me, will present some data using this approach in, in, in normal breast tissue. Um, for the lung data, what we did is an alternative approach where we took uh, bronchoscopy samples um, from patients as they were having diagnostic or therapeutic uh, bronchoscopies. And we take a biopsy, a little pinch biopsy, tiny little thing, pinch biopsy of normal uh, bronchial epithelium, dissociate those cells and then grow them as single cells uh, on a mouse feeder layer, and then we sequence the colony that grows. Uh, and that gives very nice uh, genome um, uh, burden of mutations um, uh, and is, is pretty well recognized. Of course, it's not available for many tissues because we can't grow the cells, as, as Dave was saying earlier, uh, for uh, many tissues. Uh, but for those tissues that you can grow, it works very well. 
Um, as I said, we're chugging through a range of, uh, of the organs. Um, in fact, this is not an exhaustive list. We have uh, a number of projects um, coming, and Tim will talk about breast as well. Um, uh, these are also, in, as we chug through these, we're chugging through trying to publish them, um, and, uh, and there's, they're kind of drifting out as, as, as time goes on. Uh, I'm going to concentrate today on this data set, which is uh, unpublished yet. So what we did is we took 16 subjects, we had three children, four never smokers, six ex-smokers, and three current smokers. As I say, we took pinch biopsies or brushings uh, at uh, diagnostic or therapeutic bronchoscopy, uh, dissociated and sorted single basal cells, grew them uh, into colonies for sequencing, uh, and then did uh, whole genome sequencing on those colonies uh, for all of the things that you see there. Um, and, uh, and, of course, what we're really interested in is seeing what happens to mutation burden uh, in, across those different cells. And what you can see here is the data from the non-smokers, the children here, and then the adult never smokers here. Each of these dots represents one of the cells that we sequenced uh, and the mutation burden of that cell. And you can see it follows, by and large, a very nice linear accumulation of mutations with age. This is indeed what we see in other tissues. This is data from endometrium and from esophagus. And you can see that in each of these tissues and pretty much all of the organs that we've looked at thus far with the maybe the exception of prostate uh, the mutation burden accumulates in normal tissues by and large linearly uh, with age which suggests that the mutation rate is constant per unit time uh, and that is um, around about 20 to 25 mutations uh, per year per cell uh, so that's a mutation every couple of weeks or so uh, in each of your lung cells and you think how many lung cells that you've got as you're sitting here, you will be accumulating mutations, and that will be making you wonder whether this was the best use of your time. <laughs> um, so now, you might imagine that smoking uh, does um, quite a lot of damage, and indeed it does. So this is what uh, that, same, that same curve here, that's the line that I was showing you before for the never smokers, and this is uh, the, the, cell, the mutation burden in a bunch of cells from uh, current and ex-smokers, and you can see that there's this really massive increase in mutation burden, an average of about 2,000 mutations in ex-smokers and an average of about 5,000 mutations per cell in current smokers. Some of these cells have mutation burdens well in excess of 10,000 mutations, uh, and these are totally normal cells. Um, there are some kind of rather more subtle things in here which I think are really interesting. So, so one of the major things is each of the patients here uh, we, we sequenced, you know, 30, 40 cells from each patient. And you can see that there's this huge within-patient heterogeneity in the mutation burden. So these are, these are cells that are basically next to one another in the bronchial epithelium, and they'll have this range of mutations from essentially a near-normal mutation burden up to many tens of thousands. From the same patient exposed to the same cigarette smoke in the same geographical region of the lung, completely uh, perplexing variation in mutation burden uh, from individuals, and you can sort of see it with the, uh, the estimated standard deviations here. The second thing to draw out is that there is this population of cells here. So here's the, here's the, this is the expected curve for never smokers, and you can see in the green and purple that there are some cells in these, norm, in these current and ex-smokers that have a near-normal mutation burden. So they basically uh, have the same number of mutations as if the patient had never smoked. Um, and uh, to, um, to draw that out in a little bit more detail, this is the fraction of cells that have a near-normal mutation burden in the, lung of, in the lungs of these ex-smokers and current smokers. And the striking thing here is that the fraction of these cells is much higher in ex-smokers than in current smokers. About fourfold more cells have this near-normal mutation burden uh, in the ex-smokers. I'm going to come back to these cells uh, during the talk. So that's mutation burden, clearly uh, a rather more complex picture than we were anticipating when we started this. I thought it would be relatively straightforward, um, but the, the within patient heterogeneity is totally unexpected. Um, so we can drill into that in a little bit more detail uh, and look at the mutational signatures. This is a mutographs meeting, after all. This is what um, uh, a tobacco carcinogen looks like on your DNA. This is uh, uh, benzoapyrene bound to a guanine, and you can see that's this hideous... 
uh, adduct here that's bound to the guanine, and you can see that it completely distorts the DNA helix. And you can imagine that if you're a DNA polymerase wanting to copy this strand uh, during DNA replication, that you're going to come along this strand, you're going to hit this thing, and you really aren't going to know what you're going to put in opposite it, and that's what causes mutations. Um, and as you've heard many times during this meeting, we can uh, develop methods to extract the mutational, uh, the mutational signatures that we see in these uh, lung cells. So this is the 630 lung cells. Each, each of the columns here is a lung cell uh, grouped by the different patients. Uh, and the proportion of mutations in each of those lung cells that can be attributed to the different mutational processes. So there are some interesting things in here. The first is that in the children, we have somewhat more of this uh, signature one, which is the cytosine deamination signature. We believe that this is somewhat higher during um, uh, embryogenesis and development, and that that's why it's a relatively higher proportion in the children. The second thing that you can see is that there are occasional cells here with quite a lot of uh, signatures 2 and 13, these pink and purple ones. Um, that is the signature of apobec mutagenesis. So we are seeing the evidence of apobec mutagenesis in normal lung cells, uh, including in children. Um, and you can see this is on the top here is the burden of mutations. And you can see that in the children, most of these cells have you know, 100 or so mutations, and then there'll be an occasional cell that will have four or 500 mutations, and the difference is all caused by apobec. Uh, so this is a, happening even in childhood. Um, you can see further that in the smokers and ex-smokers, uh, we have, as you might imagine, lots of signature four, which is the uh, tobacco signature, um, and there's, uh, it, it varies from... Um, from, from uh, cell to cell within the same individuals, and those cells with the near normal mutation burden um, that you can see here have much less of the signature four. So that's perhaps not surprising. They have all of the same processes that one sees in the, uh, in the never smokers, um, but those cells somehow have managed to avoid the toxicity of cigarette uh, uh, smoke exposure, um, uh, even though their neighboring cells have, have, have really got damaged by it. And then finally, there's this other signature here which emerges in one of the patients, uh, signature B, which looks like this uh, with predominant adenine mutations. Um, and this is an entirely novel signature um, that we see really in, in this patient uh, to, to quite a lot of, uh, to quite an extent, and in some of the other smokers as well, but not at all in the never smokers. So we believe it is a tobacco associated signature, much stronger in this person. And this is one of the things that I think is quite interesting. Um, cigarettes, when one looks, have very variable amounts of the different carcinogens from different brands. And uh, I think one of the ways of trying to tease apart. Uh, which carcinogens contribute to uh, which mutational processes is to look, uh, is to collect information on what brands of cigarettes people have smoked uh, and see if we can tease apart some of these signatures. And one of the advantages of looking in normal tissue is that one looks at many, many, one can look at many, many independent clones from the same individual uh, rather than just one cancer per individual. Uh, and that gives one a lot more statistical power for separating, as you can see in this one patient, we're really only able to extract the signature separately because we have 30 or 40 different genomes from the same individual uh, with presumably the same exposure. We don't know what causes it uh, uh, at all. So we can go a little bit further with the mutational signatures in, in terms of timing them and layering them on a phylogenetic tree. So, so this is like any old family tree that you see, basically um, where we, we uh, each of the ends of these is one of the cells that we've sequenced, and what we're doing is looking back at the sort of uh, relationships, the clonal relationships between those cells. So you can see if you look at this particular set of cells here, they actually are somewhat genetically related. They share about 1,000 mutations here, uh, and then there was a cell here that d divided, uh, and this ultimate cell that we've sequenced here derived from one of those daughter cells, and this group of cells derived from that ancestral cell, and there's further clonal relationships in amongst these cells. And you can see when we look across the individuals that there are some kind of interesting patterns of clonal structure. Now, we can take each of the mutations 
uh, on these different branches of the phylogenetic tree and then work out what mutational signatures have caused those mutations and layer them on the phylogenetic tree. And this is what we get. So, so basically, this is uh, the same as that stacked bar plot I was showing you before, but now layered onto the phylogenetic tree. And you can see that in the never smokers, um, the mutations are largely... Uh, the, the sort of endogenous mutational processes that we would expect. And this patient is interesting because she has the um, apobet signature in some of these cells. And what's kind of interesting is that, uh, that we, we're seeing evidence in vivo of the in vitro phenomenon that Mia talked about yesterday where we see this episodic mutagenesis. So, for example, if you look at this uh, pair of cells here, their ancestor had some burst of apobec activity, but now the two cells, they basically have, since they diverged, have no evidence of apobec mutagenesis. And then if you look at these, this pair of cells here, they're very recently diverged from one another. I mean, this top cell here has hardly any extra mutations, and yet its, its sister cell uh, there has many uh, extra hundreds of mutations uh, from Apobec. So really confirming in vivo what Mia described in vitro, uh, that Apobec mutagenesis can act in an, in an episodic uh, fashion. So um, the second thing that you can see here in the X smoker is a proportion of cells with, uh, with, with near normal mutation burden. Um, and you can see the absence of signature 4 in red here. And you can see that in this particular individual, that is a polyclonal expansion. Those cells are not deriving from a single cell with a near normal mutation burden. They're derived from multiple cells with near normal mutation burden. So this is a polyclonal outgrowth of, of cells with near normal mutation burden. And that's typically what we see in these X smokers. And then in the current smokers, you can see the, 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 the rather depressing amount of red in there. So obviously we're interested in what mutations can cause uh, uh, functional consequences to the cells, uh, driver mutations, uh, and we do find plenty of driver mutations in the data set. They occur in the genes that you would expect that you would see in a squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, uh, lots of p53 mutations, notch1 mutations, and fat1. These are the exact same genes that we see in squamous cell uh, carcinomas of many different tissue types. They're also the same genes that we see in uh, normal skin and normal, in normal squamous esophagus. Um, some of these other genes we've also seen before, uh, members of Swysniff signaling, for example. You can see that there are some cells when we, when we do this, uh, each of the columns here is a single cell. You can see that there are some cells here that have two or even three uh, driver mutations um, of, of different types uh, within the same cell. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, those driver mutations increase in uh, smokers. Um, so they actually, there's, there's present even in kind of 5, 10% of, of normal lung cells by the time you're sort of middle-aged to elderly, even if you've never smoked, including some cells with, with two drivers here. Um, but the rate um, increases with, with age, so the number of driver mutations accumulates with age, I'm afraid. Um, and, uh, and also, it, it not surprisingly, increases with, um, with the, uh, the number of, uh, with, with whether people have a tobacco history or not. Uh, and this is uh, those same three phylogenetic trees that I showed you before with the, with the driver mutations layered on. You can see what this allows us to do is to get a sense of when in that person's life those mutations are occurring. So you can see that in some cases uh, those driver mutations are occurring pretty early uh, during the, the kind of evolution of this particular clone. And in this particular instance would seem to have set up an entire clonal expansion here that all derives from this cell with the original p53 mutation and then that's one of those cells has also acquired a, a FAT1 uh, mutation much later. Um, here are some other late uh, driver mutations um, and, and there's another early P53 mutation. So you can use this to kind of get a sense of the timing uh, of driver mutations occurring during life. So the final thing that I want to talk about is, is looking at telomeres. And the reason that we were interested in telomeres is that telomeres shorten with, um, with uh, cell division and, um, and uh, so 
they can they can act measuring telomeres lengths can act as a as a way of kind of uh, in making inferences about the mitotic history of those cells. And when one sequences the genome, one sequences the telomeres, and there are now algorithms that you can use to uh, measure the telomere lengths in your cells. So we took our um, cells and uh, our, our genomes and measured the telomere lengths in those cells. And this is what we see. So each of these dots is a uh, cell that we've sequenced. On the x-axis is the telomere length, and on the y-axis is the mutation burden. And you can see in the children and the never, adult never smokers, there's really not very much of a relationship between the mutation burden and the telomere length. But in the current smokers to an extent, but particularly strikingly in the ex-smokers, there's a very strong negative correlation uh, between, um, between the, uh, each of these different lines represents the slopes for a different, the estimated slopes for a different patient. You can see that there's uh, this very strong negative correlation between telomere length and mutation burden. And in particular, those cells with the near normal mutation burden down here have much, much longer telomeres than uh, the cells uh, with uh, more mutations. So what that tells us is that those cells with the near normal mutation burden have undergone, presumably, many fewer mitoses during their life than their more mutated counterparts. Um, and that is suggestive that potentially um, there's a pool of cells that's relatively quiescent during life um, and that sort of expands up once, once someone stops smoking and eventually replenishes uh, or begins to replenish the bronchial epithelium uh, with, with cells without, um, with, with near normal mutation burden. So, um, so it's a kind of interesting story. So just to, to sort of finish there then, um, to, to draw out the key points, smoking increases the mutation burden by somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 mutations per cell um, with this really striking within patient uh, variation in mutation burden that, that remains rather um, uh, unexplained. Um, driver mutations increase in smokers and with age. Um, and there's this population of cells particularly prevalent in ex-smokers uh, with a near normal mutation burden. And, and what's kind of interesting about this population of cells is, is that there are two, there are two things which are, which are puzzling. One, uh, how they've managed to avoid being ravaged by tobacco uh, when all of their neighbors have been, um, have been damaged by tobacco. And how have they managed to expand when a person stops smoking? And uh, really, um, the, the kind of fact that they have longer telomeres suggests that the way that they expand, or that the, that the way that they've, uh, well, we don't know, basically. In mouse models, there's uh, some, some nice mouse models of, um, of uh, injury to the lung where you expose the lung to naphthalene or other um, sort of really toxic chemicals. Um, and then what happens if you look at the cells that replenish the lung after such an injury, they, they come from a um, protected niche in the submucosal glands. And it may be, there's, people have wondered about whether that same population of, of cells that can replenish the lung uh, could also exist in humans, but there's not been much evidence for it. This may argue that there's a stem cell niche, our data may argue that there is a stem cell niche that's somehow protected from exposure to cigarette smoke. Um, and that cells within that, uh, that within that niche, once the, the sort of smoking stops, can begin to expand and, re and regenerate and re replenish the bronchial epithelium with cells that, that are less damaged. And of course, that's really uh, exciting sort of public health message that if you stop smoking, your, your lung will essentially, to, to an extent, regenerate uh, with cells that, that haven't been damaged by cigarettes. Um, but also is kind of interesting from the epidemiological data about why when someone stops smoking does the, does the, do the health benefits begin almost immediately. And this kind of gives you an, uh, an obvious um, potential explanation for that observation. So anyway, there we are. Um, that's where I want to finish. Um, Kenichi Yoshida, um, uh, together with Kate Gowers uh, at uh, UCL, uh, did the work. Kenichi did the analysis of the uh, genomes, uh, and Kate uh, did the heroic job of growing all of those uh, organoids, um, and it, with lots of help from uh, people at Sanger uh, and our uh, very good collaborator down at uh, University College London, Sam Jaynes. Thank you.